Hey now everyone, before we get into our review and breakdown of The Acolyte Episode 3, a little spoiler warning, spoiler. The Acolyte went full flashback on us this week, and boy did Episode 3 provide some reveals about Brendock, the twins, the four Jedi, and the Witch Coven, albeit from a certain point of view, which makes this show's murder mystery plot even more intriguing when you consider that what you're seeing is framed by the person or faction you are watching. We all may think we now know what happened that fateful evening on Brendock, but clearly we are missing some key information that we will undoubtedly get via additional flashbacks, hopefully from another character's perspective than Osha's, to fully reveal the truth of that night and show that the disaster had been framed different ways by everyone involved to serve their own needs. This is what I enjoy about The Acolyte. Its murder mystery plot and the slow drip reveals from different points of views keep the viewer guessing as to what is really the truth or if that truth is even the real truth depending on whose point of view it is being framed with. Trying to speculate in theorycraft is more than half the fun of being a fan of a mega franchise like Star Wars, so I absolutely appreciate this show's story and how it is being delivered in a way that you can't really ever trust what you are seeing until the full story is revealed from all points of view. In addition to having an engaging narrative, the Acolyte continues to do a great job in showcasing how other people in this galaxy view the Force and how it should be curated, if curated at all. The idea that the Jedi are the only ones who should use it and wield it for their purposes is kind of ridiculous. George himself declared everything has the Force, so it's refreshing to see how this Witch Coven approaches it in comparison to the much guarded and strict approach of the Jedi. It's interesting to see how the Jedi were perceived outside of Coruscant, and so far this series is doing a great job at showcasing how this benevolent order could become so complacent that they allow the Sith to rise right under the nose and be in the same room as them without having the faintest ideas that they're about to be wiped out. They truly do feel like the Force has to be used their way, or you better hit the highway and potentially be persecuted and attacked if you don't fall in line. It's pretty clear to see why the witches don't trust the Jedi, and there's a good chance the Jedi and or Sith were the ones that nearly hunted them to extinction for using the Force in a way their religion deems blasphemous. I mean, they do just kind of spy on the witches and the twins for who knows how long, and then claim that the girls have to be tested with permission. In fact, Indara said it was their right, and if the test is passed, the child must leave. So imagine a faction showing up on your planet, making these demands, albeit in a calm manner with a smile on their faces. It's not too hard to see why many in the galaxy didn't trust them or thought they were abusing their power and eventually cheered on their genocide during the fall of the Republic. While we as fans have always thought the Jedi to be Christ-like heroes, it's nice to see how their actions could be perceived as something very much different and possibly wrong in some ways. It shows that even the most honorable of institutions can be corrupted by the best intentions. The Acolyte definitely has me hooked and thinking about what will happen next, so I do enjoy the narrative and mostly the overall look of the show. But I have to say that three episodes in, there is something just off with the overall production. Some of the performances are extremely rough and feel even more wooden than some of the worst acted prequel moments. The direction is off in some capacity because sometimes entire scenes come off as wonky feeling. There are great performances like that of Jodie Turner-Smith as the mother, but mostly each scene feels slightly off and it's hard to pinpoint exactly what's wrong. Maybe some of these scenes could have been edited down better, performed better, directed better, or a combination of the three, but due to the wonky feel of the direction, this show does struggle to have amazing standout moments like most fans are used to getting, which is odd because the story is there. That's not the problem with the Acolyte, even though some fans are screaming foul about it, claiming it breaks canon, which it is not yet, but more on that later. I hate to harp on child actors, and their performance is ultimately in the hands of the writers and, ep and the episode director, so the blame should be placed on the adults in the room, but the young May and Osha were hard to stomach at times, thanks to the overly whiny and emotionless delivery they were coached to give. It just got annoying, and I feel like a jerk for saying it, but the young characters didn't come off well to me at all. The Ascension Ceremony was also extremely weird, and I'm not sure in a good way. 
Again, I like the alternate takes on how different cultures embrace the force, but my goodness, that power of one song and chant was rough sounding and looking, and the background actors were allowed to dominate the moment, taking away from the story and making the viewer feel a bit out of place. Like I said though, for me, I'm finding the murder mystery aspect of this series to be very well done and I definitely can't wait to see where things go. So while this show is far from perfect, its story is worth investing in still. Top moments or at least key ones. Yeah, it's weird. I wouldn't say these are standout oh my goodness moments, but they offered up some cool insights into the show's plot and Star Wars lore starting with the thread training scene. It was just cool to hear another group's take on the Force because that's a concept rarely touched upon in core live action Star Wars, at least from a non-Sith and Jedi point of view. This scene also showed how different the twins were, how wise the mother is, and how reactive Cordell is, foreshadowing the events to come. Up next would be the arrival of the Jedi during the overly odd ascension ceremony. Again, nothing wild happened, but it was a solid lore dump and thrust the whole concept of should any one person or faction be in charge of the force. We saw how powerful the witches could be if pushed, and we also saw how the Jedi can use the power of the Republic to get what they want. It also teased how suspicious the Jedi were for even being there in the first place. Trust me, they weren't there to make friends and just test the girls. They knew something shady was up and were going to get the girls no matter what. Finally, I'm going with the fire event because it's even less clear now what happened even though it seems like we got all the answers from Osha's point of view of the events. Yes, May is out of control and does threaten to kill Osha, but we have to wonder what got her to that place and I think her forced walk with Mother Cordell had a hand in May's approach. While we do see May grab the lantern and, and stare lovingly into the flame, we only see her light Osha's journal on fire. The camera cuts back to Osha and then a few moments later you can hear the lantern crash. So did May actually do it on purpose? Was it an accident after she realized what she was doing? Or hear me out. What if Saul was still spying on the twins, or he was sent to grab them when the Jedi undoubtedly showed up at the Citadel that evening under the guise of helping? How did Saul know May started the fire unless he was there? Maybe he even tried to stop her, and that is what led to her dropping the lantern. There's no way that fire took out all the witches either, and its spreading to their reactor seemed very suspicious as well. At least the speed in which it did so, and based on an earlier scene where Cordo hears something in the reactor room, one could speculate that a plan was already in the work to take out the witch coven before the night of the fire. So yes, the Jedi were involved in some capacity. It just comes down to did they willingly attack the witches after they learned they made babies using some form of dark magic? Or did someone or another faction set things in motion to frame the Jedi, split the sisters, and begin training Mei in the dark side of the force? Neat stuff in my opinion, people. Okay, eggs and references time. Mother Coral is a Zabrik, like our homie Maul, and she seems to have a temper like him too. The twins love spice cream. I just hope that like booze, the effects of spice cook off when prepared. Okay, I'm going to spend a minute on this next one because while I agree that the twins conception does feel a bit chosen one prophecy like, if you actually listen to Cordill and Anisea, it's very clear that the twins were not conceived by the force alone, which is what the chosen one prophecy is. There's an unnatural element to their creation. Here's what was said. Cordell, I carried them, mother, I created them. Cordell, and what happens if the Jedi discover how you created them? So there you have it. The mother did some wild, more than likely dark side experiment to create life in her partner, which does not infringe upon Anakin's origins and the prophecy. It's okay. Take a deep breath. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. Be kind to each other out there and consider liking this video, subbing to the channel, or becoming a channel member. You can do all that below. And remember, there's always time for Star Wars time. And if you listen to the Star Wars time show, the Force will be with you always.